Hello, everyone, and uh, thank you for tuning in. Good morning, 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 and delighted to uh, to welcome you all to this uh, first, yes, indeed, the very first in a series of informal broadcasts and chats and interviews uh, with interesting guests and personalities. We're calling it In Conversation With, hosted by myself, Michael McGrath, speaker, record-breaking polar adventurer, and the founder and CEO, otherwise known as the Chief Muscle Warrior of the Muscle Health Foundation charity. So what's the mission uh, of this, uh, this new program, this series of conversations? Well, first and foremost, it's all about helping our community of muscle warriors across the country to feel less isolated and more connected. For those viewers tuning in that don't know, the Muscle Health Foundation is a small, multi-award winning, family-centered charity, and it's all about delivering transformational dreams, muscle dreams, highly personalized experiences uh, in the UK for children and young people between the ages of eight and 28 with the muscle wasting disease, muscular dystrophy. It's a disease that's uh, slowly destroying my life, but not my spirit. I know there are several beneficiaries and families, you know, I'm really sorry, but I, I can't give you all a, a shout out, but also supporters and uh, other advocates uh, who've tuned in to hear from our first guest, who I know, who I know has um, very, very recently discovered what a muscle warrior salute is all about, but more on that a little later. So some of you will, will also know that the charity is in the midst of uh, repurposing. We're pivoting and moving to a, uh, a new virtual strategy that's currently being deployed. The COVID-19 crisis is affecting many, many charities, isn't it, across the country uh, in how they operate. And for some, like us, services have had to change in really dramatic ways, and it's not been, uh, it's not been easy. For many who are shielding, it's been a really tough time in terms of social isolation, of being locked in, of being quarantined, of being locked down. And this for me today is uh, day 65. And having spoken to many of the charities, beneficiaries and families and mums and dads over the last six or seven weeks over the phone, I know that because of uh, COVID-19, they're feeling more vulnerable, even more isolated, anxious, stressed, and in some cases, terrified. It's hard. But you know, we remain resolute. Uh, we remain determined to continue our vital work. And that's why we're coming together, uniting, reaching out uh, even more and having positive, supportive conversations that uplift and hopefully inform and inspire a little. So a few quick housekeeping points. Firstly, a note on safeguarding. We have eyes. We have eyes over this broadcast. So if any inappropriate comments or behaviors are observed, suffice to say, you'll be jettisoned. I think that's the, uh, the submarine terminology. And secondly, all episodes are being recorded and in due course, they'll be published online. We've got a number of really, really exciting events coming up over the next few months, not least with our next In Conversation With broadcast on Friday the 29th of May. So pop that date in your diary, Friday the 29th of May. Uh, the series will be called Family Communication Skills in Times of Adversity. Do you know we've all had some household tensions? Yes, and it's going to be a cracker. So before we uh, batten down the hatches and lower the periscope, and just before I introduce our first guest, former submarine commander Ryan Ramsey, here's a short video to kick off this morning's proceedings.
So we might have had a little technical, uh, a little technical error there um, in terms of the volume, and it may well be that we uh, we go back and um, you know actually replay that video if we get time, because it really does give um, a really good insight uh, in terms of what uh, our next guest is going to be talking a little about. But anyway, Ryan, let me see. Ryan, are you there? Let's see if we can get the, uh, Ryan in on screen. Aha. Hello. Hello. Hi, Ryan. Very, very welcome and uh, really great to meet you. And thanks so much for joining us today. I know we had a little technical glitch there. We may be that we come back to the video at some point during our chat. But now, listen, I understand that you're quite handy on the um, on the guitar and tinkling the ivories. Uh, I'm not much of a fan of movies like uh, The Hunt or Red October or indeed Crimson Tide. Is that right? I, I, I do like playing the piano. I think that's why I wouldn't say I was handy on it, but I do enjoy playing. Uh, I think people suffer my guitar playing, um, and, and that's a really pleasure for me. Um, and yeah, submarine movies, you know, submariners are the worst critics of submarine movies, and I'm sure that's the same for for other specializations as well. So, um, so yeah, so there are good movies. So you've captained the nuclear-powered submarine HMS Turbulent, one of the most interesting facts that I've also discovered and perhaps more importantly, Ryan, is that I understand that you're a qualified football referee. So undoubtedly, you're you're good at uh, managing conflict on and perhaps off the pitch during a weekend footy practice. I, I do like the um, I do like managing conflict. So um, so football refereeing for me is exactly that. You know, two groups of people that get onto a pitch. Uh, they want a good game. Most of them don't understand the laws of the game that they're playing, and therefore it's just about keeping them apart and making sure that they have a good game and play within the laws of the game. So you spent 6,200 <clears throat> days, I believe, at sea during your your submarine career. And I suspect you know a thing or two about isolation. So my first question, Ryan, is, is simply this, you know, how, how did it all start? So I, I always wanted to be in the military. So from about six years old, I decided that um, I wanted to be in the military and um, I decided I wanted to be a pilot. Um, so I managed to join the Navy as what's called a, an observer, and they are the um, sort of the co-pilot, effectively. Uh, but I wasn't very good at it. And in fact, I found myself in the back of a jet stream aircraft, looking at radar screens, feeling really, really sick, <coughs> unable to pass. Oh, wow. the and I didn't pass the. Um, I didn't pass the test. So I went to the surface fleet. Uh, they they wanted to keep me in the Navy. Um, and which I was really glad about. Um, I, and while I was in the surface fleet, uh, I managed to go and visit a submarine for a day. I thought, this is incredible. It is just crazy stuff. But the teamwork's brilliant, and I really want to do this as a job. So that was the day for me. Um, yeah. And I didn't really want to be it. And about a year later, I joined the submarine service. Excellent. How do you... Um... How did you cope with the, you know, the emotional and physical challenges of working, you know, in a confined environment? You know, here we are, a lot, a lot of, um, mm -hmm. certainly within the context of, of the charity, but much wider field, a lot of people are in lockdown right now and feeling increasingly isolated and alone. How, how did you cope with confinement, if you like? Yeah, I think I think we, we've got to take our hats off to everybody um, that's undergoing uh, the lockdown at the moment because the reality is submariners, uh, Royal Navy people, military people are trained for this stuff. So, so you don't just go on board a submarine; you do a whole load of training before you get there. So you learn the skills uh, that are important to live in that environment. Whereas what we've done is we put this entire nation into a situation that they've had no training for. So the fact we've made it to day sixty-five is pretty amazing when you think about it. So, um, but for me in the submarine service, uh, it was all about training. Uh, there, there is an emotional journey, you know, that happens all the time. And actually it, it never ever uh, gets easier it, the, the longer you're in the service, arguably it gets yeah. harder. So, um, and it's just being able to cope with that. No, you know what's coming. Um, <clears throat> so you focus on sailing to start with, uh, you know, you don't know when you're gonna come back initially. Um, so, so it might be a 90 day patrol, it might be a 60 day patrol. So focus to the very end first, um, to the maximum time. And if you get back any earlier than that, then that's a good thing. One of the um, one of the points you made when we were chatting a little earlier um, is around, you know, how difficult isolation can be when you're actually alone. If you don't have a green patch mm. outside your home or your apartment, um, you know, that's that that's really hard. I'm just trying to think how isolation would work. 
um, for, you know, for example, any of our families or, or our young people in terms of how they would feel if they were on board a submarine. You know, yeah. how, how, do you, how do you bring people into understanding that they're going to be in a steel tube for however many days, weeks, months? Yes. Yeah, so, so, well, the first piece is to focus on the mission um, and, and realize why you're there as opposed to oh. what you're going to be doing. Um, the second one is to get into the routine as quickly as possible. So uh, what, what you're doing is you're transitioning from one world into a, into a totally different world. I mean, it's the most, the most complex platform that the military owns and you take it somewhere that's less explored than space and you go, you go operate against potential enemies and everything else. So getting into a routine quickly is very, very important. Um, <clears throat> and within that routine, it's about taking breaks. I mean, we're expecting people to stay focused for 90 days, uh, may, maybe longer. And so making sure that you've got a routine that allows you to rest, that allows you and gives you permission to take the breaks you need um, is exceptionally important. And that, and that maintains focus. Um, so so I, I would have my, if, if I was taking specialist riders or I was taking different groups of people that weren't my submarine crew to see with me, it was all about integrating them very quickly into that routine, developing their own personal routine as well that matches that um, and making sure that they stay focused throughout. I think we can. I think we can put up a picture just to give people a, a little bit of a sense of, of um, not only HMS Turbulent but also, um, you know, the inside of your sub, um, which we're going to see in a second. Hopefully, here it comes. Seamless technology there. Oh, oh yes. Yeah. So that's the day before we sailed on on my last. Uh, deployment which was a uh, 286 days away from the uk and that's not all of my crew um that's about two-thirds there's another third still inside the submarine so it's a lot of people to fit into a steel tube how, and the how, many, people, how many sorry how many people can you get on board uh so so you gen so the maximum crew number is 130 um there's only 94 beds so some people are sharing the same bed not not at the same time obviously but um, you, because our watch keeping cycle is six hours on, six hours off continuously. Um, when you when you jump out of bed to get on watch, somebody else might jump into your bed or use a sleeping bag on on, on the bed that you're you're sitting on. But yeah, that crew have to operate together because if you don't um, if you don't operate together, uh, it doesn't work. That you know you've got all the best technology, but it's the people that make that submarine effective. Yeah, yeah, no, no, no. That, that's you know that's that's good in, good insight. Um, that already, as we've been speaking, there are um, quite a few questions coming in. So I'm going to I'm going to sort of just um, uh, ask the first question uh, as we go along, and we'll keep our framework, we'll keep our um, structure. But I just want to pop a few questions in. So um, one of our questions from uh, from Samuel actually is one of uh, the charity's beneficiaries. Um, he said, uh, "Let's have a look. Uh, what would you say is your favourite film involving a submarine?" Okay, so so um, I, I mean, like I say, I could I, I I look at submarine movies, and sometimes they're not quite like the real thing. So so let me take you through a few of them. The the best one that you could possibly watch is called Das Boot, and uh, it's about a Second World War U boat, and that is very very accurate. Um, I like Crimson Tide, despite the fact it's exceptionally dramatic. But I'm a big Denzel Washington and Gene Hackman fan, and I always. I, yeah, I always thought that American submarines weren't like that, but and then I did a two-year exchange with the, the US Navy and I learned that quite a lot of it was similar. They don't fight, obviously, against each other in there, but a lot of those drills were exactly as uh, exactly as they happen. Yeah. And then <clears throat> the funniest one, <laughs> which is which is quite close to the truth, is a film called Down Periscope with Kelsey Kramer in it. And um, and it's a comedy, but but the reality is a lot of that is actually true. Yeah. So, yeah. Um, so I would say yeah. those three if you're going to watch anything. But another question here from from Sam. Sam, um, hi Sam. Uh, Sam is one of our Muscle Dream beneficiaries who spent some time with uh, Ray Mears uh, here down in uh, down in the forest in West Sussex, I think it was. And Sam has asked, got a question for you. We'll try and keep the answer fairly short. But what does Ryan think of the uh, the Trident nuclear deterrent? Yeah, so it's an it's a it's a necessity. So uh, the fact is, it's been running for over fifty years, and we haven't had to fight a. Uh, a world war a major war it's the last line of defense of the united kingdom and um and in fact you never want to use that I, I always said that my my job as a captain of an attack submarine was way easier 
than that of my colleagues who are commanding the Trident um, submarines. Um, that's, that's a huge responsibility to, to have to do that. But the objective is never to do that, and it's worked quite well. Okay, brilliant. Another quick question from um, Corey over in uh, Bedfordshire, Dunstable. Hi, Corey. Um, Corey is asking, uh, uh, let's have a look, if you've been in a situation where you've been close to attacking an enemy submarine. Um, so so, so that, that, that would be very classified. But I will talk about exercises if you want to know about that. So, uh, so what we do do, um, y y there are real missions, obviously, but we do a lot of submarine versus submarine exercises to up those skills. And that's just the best fun out to go up against um, another NATO submarine. Uh, and it's, it is like pure warfare because you, you don't want to be the one that loses. So, um, so it's great. It focuses the mind. It's one team against another team. Um, <clears throat> somewhere there's, you know, you, you think you can't hide in the ocean and yet there are places you can hide. It's fantastic. Yeah. But all those skills are important because the yeah. reality is that prepares you for operations. So I've Excellent. sort of avoided Thank your you. question, but shared what it's like. Yeah, nice one. Thank you. Thank <clears throat> you. So um, Leah's got a question on food, but we're going to come on to food just a little bit later. Oh, um, yeah. So <laughs> we'll do food later. Um, so do you know what? We're, we're, we're going to come out of this, aren't we? I mean, that's a fact. Yeah. And I'm I'm someone that likes to deal in facts rather than sort of grey areas. And and I know that how we live our lives going forwards is you know it's going to be different. Social distancing, um, but also levels of anxiety. And, and people are talking a lot about um, this word resilience. Yes. So what top tip would or top tips, uh, Ryan? Would you recommend you know to help those perhaps more vulnerable groups to mm. to stay strong and to stay positive? Yeah, so, so I think the first one is 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 what I said at the very beginning, which is amazing that we've achieved 65 days already. I mean, that's a huge achievement. That's just and, to me. That's just my own personal lockdown diary number 65 today. Yeah, but you, you're out there. there. And some of us started a couple of weeks before that, so we're still going. So I think, I think the fact that habits form after 30 days and this has become a norm, um, you, we, we should be proud about, everybody should be proud about how they've, they've dealt with this situation and how they've progressed with it. The second one is we will come out of this. We must come out of this. Um, and it might not be next week and it might be months down the line, but there is an end in sight to this because there has to be. Um, so by focusing, so so for me, what I've done is said, it's not going to be until September. And why yeah. have I said September? Because that's my own expectation management. And therefore what I'm not doing is hankering after next week for it to end. I'm thinking about, a lot further, uh, further afield. And yeah. for me, it manages expectations. It sets me in that routine. I'm going to stay in this routine for another few months. And if it comes forward from that, that's going to be great too. Um, and it's going to be a different world is the other piece. I think we need to prepare ourselves for that. That is not going to be the same world that we left. Um, and some of that, I, I find all the positives that go with that are, are the things to focus on as opposed to what, what the, the negatives, you know, there's gonna be some amazing things um, that, that change for us all and we should focus on those going forward. Um, and it's, it's hard work, but as, as long as you give yourself a reasonable um, exit date, uh, then you're able to, to manage it. Yeah. How, do you, how, do you, um, how do you think people's <laughs> behaviors have changed just in terms of, you know, things like just being, you know, a little more kind to people? Are you noticing a shift in people's behavior change? Yeah, I, I think so. For example, um, it's connecting with families that you might, family members via um, these mediums that you 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 would not normally have done. I mean, I've caught up with people that I would not normally have caught up with because I've been a slave to the uh, the corporate well, the corporate world and helping organisations. You know, my days were really really long from six in the morning till seven eight at night, and lots of travel involved in it, and that's all gone. And I've used yeah. that time differently. Yeah. Yeah. Fantastic. The other yeah. bit is nicer to each other i think people are saying hello um yeah. people are fitter I, I see more people running than than i've ever seen um so, so i'm not, I think I'm not doing any running i'm doing lots of wheeling ryan but there you go so so i think i think there's all these positive things um and as long as you concentrate on those positives and and try and push the negatives you know the, the fact that you could you could argue we're we're constrained in our own homes where we are mm -hmm. um but there's so many positives that you can lever off so let's have a natter about um, about food um, and tell me about fleet portions and, and so on. That's be interesting to learn a little bit more about that. Fleet portions, yes, the uh, the dreaded word. Um, so so in essence, the limiting factor on any submarine is food. 
Um, basically, a submarine has a nuclear reactor, so it's got power continuously. Uh, it creates its own air, creates its own water. Um, so you've got that. Um, and the people go on forever. Um, it's amazing how long people can can do this stuff for. Um, mm. so food becomes a limiting factor. So you sell with 90 days stores. Um, some of that will be fresh, some will be frozen, and some will be dried uh, or canned or whatever else. Um, and quickly the fresh food runs out and then you're onto <coughs> frozen and dried food. Mm. And the dreaded moment that you're not waiting. So you could be on a 60 day patrol and as it's getting cl getting closer to that 60 days, but you know there's something something's not quite right because the operation's still going on a bit longer. And then a message will come through generally for the captain that turns around and says, prepare to extend uh, because either the, another submarine is not available. So, they, so, so then the dreaded term comes out, which is fleet portions. And <laughs> the ships now are trying to extend the food beyond 90 days to 110, 120 days. And so oh, they yeah. control all the food. And it's um, it just gets towards the end of that time, well, the 70, 80 day mark. Yeah. It's very dull food and it's portion controlled and nobody looks forward to it and everybody loses loads of weight. Um, <laughs> and, and But the positive of it is as soon as you get back alongside and you go eat fresh food for the first time and bananas are just yeah. incredible. And all of that stuff that we all take for granted now, yes. yeah. when you've had it moved, it's just such exciting stuff. One of the things we were chatting about um, earlier was around, um, you know, habits and routine and um, cleaning. Um, so, so we're going to chat for a minute just on cleaning, and then hopefully we're going to get the video back. And uh, Grace, who's leading on the production, um, shout out for Grace. Um, hopefully we can we can nail it second time round. So, uh, yeah, just talk to me about cleaning. Um, yeah. So cleaning is really, really uh, important. I say, I say that for um, the advice now, you know, that routine about um, making sure that you you get into a routine and part of that routine is cleaning, cleaning the environment that you live in. So on a submarine, um, a clean submarine is a happy submarine. That's what, that's what the motto goes. I think when you're cleaning it, you're probably not thinking like that. Um, but the reality is at the end of the day, you want to get into a, a made bed that, that if everything else goes wrong, everything else goes wrong during that day, at least you've got somewhere nice to go back to and to get into. Um, and also for us, cleanliness is, is vital because um, you can get, if one person gets ill on board the submarine, everybody gets ill because um, it's just recirculated yeah. atmosphere. Um, the, the second bit is that if, if, if the submarine's dirty, that dirt can get into uh, equipment and cause failures, uh, which yeah. you, cannot, you cannot tolerate a failure because it can have a massive effect on the submarine itself. So cleanliness became everything. You say cleanliness is like godliness and just uh, just making sure. And we transpose yeah. where we live now. So 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 a, so a clean house is a happy house. And on that you. note, let's, let's try and do the video and uh, give everyone a bit of a more of an insight of your of the world that you are in. So we're going to just transition at the minute across to the video. Keep our fingers and toes crossed because uh, I think it will give people a really good insight. Um, into the world of being on board a sub. Fingers and toes crossed. Britain's nuclear powered hunter killer submarines are in a state of constant alert. Submarines are key to the first line of defense of the United Kingdom. Threat submarine in the area. Part submerged spy. One contact visual. It's about making sure that harm doesn't reach our shores. Part deadly weapon. This is a ship of war. It is designed to inflict damage on other people. Stand by to that engagement. That is the whole purpose of the submarine, is to, uh, to deliver violence to the enemy. Fire! Historically, it's been a closed world. We're the silent service. We don't generally talk about ourselves. Flash on across to 091. But for the first time ever, this series has full access to a British submarine on patrol as we follow HMS Turbulent on her final deployment. It's the story of 130 men in an isolated, cramped and close-knit world, <laughs> thousands of miles from home and family. So I just want to phone you up and tell you how much I love you. On a mission where discipline is paramount. You can get the odd fight. In three months, you've been in front of me twice, which I think is unacceptable. Teamwork is crucial. We're a brotherhood that drive this submarine. Amazing, isn't it? Middle of the ocean, British submarine, British helicopter. 
doing their jobs. And danger is ever present. You're not sure when anything's going to go wrong. Because obviously we've got a nuclear reactor, so everything has to be done in a safe procedure. You have seen the news um, with regards to Libya. Unknown vessel, this is surface submarine. You are approaching me in a threatening manner. As they sail through the Mediterranean and into the troubled waters of the Middle East. Oh, excellent. It's such a great video because it gives people an insight into, into an incredible world. <laughs> you know, we've got so many questions. Uh, coming in, we're going to do a quick fire five minutes on questions. So, sure. um, and then we can chat a little bit more about some of the topics that we've got down here. So, first question from um, Nicole over in uh, Bedfordshire: uh, What's the scariest situation that you ever found yourself in? Um, well, quite a few to be. Uh, to, I mean, Pick one. You know, <clears throat> so I'll, I'll share one: uh, being under the ice. That's scary. So going under the uh, <clears throat> Going under the ice ice cap in a submarine um, under the North Pole and wondering where the gaps are so that if you need to surface where you're going to go, that is crazy scary. Yeah, thank you for that. Are you getting the background noise, by the way, the background sound? Good. Um, uh, hi, Leah, up in Lancashire. Hi, Leah. Um, question, what is the food like? You know, like being up in the air, does the food taste different? Yes, yeah, so, so the food the food is um, is really good to be quite frank. The chefs are amazing, um, and it's like I say, when the fresh food's still there, uh, it, it's just like normal food, effectively. Um, we, I'll tell you what the food does do, though. It tells you the day of the week. So the reality is, you can slip into because you're working six hours on, six hours off, um, and for a lot of time, it's just artificial light. You can forget what day it is, um, but the way you know the day. And you know the time is by the food and the smell. Hey, so, it's Fish and Chip Friday today. It is, yeah. Fish and Chip Friday today. Saturday's steak night. Wednesday's curry night. Um, <laughs> Sunday's roast dinner and then pizza in the evening. Um, and that's how you know what day it is. And, of course, you can yeah. smell breakfast, so you know it's in the morning if, if it's then. Yeah, it's incredible, really. Another question from, um, from um, Stephanie uh, Castellet-Tyrrell. Hi, Stephanie. Um, so, question, Ryan, were you able to play games in your leisure time on board the sub? Yes. So, so uh, obviously, there's no connection to the internet, particularly whilst you're um, dive. So, people play board games, of all things. So, there was an Xbox, there was PlayStation 4 and all that kind of stuff. But the reality was... Um, there's a great game called Uckers, which looks a lot like Ludo, but I tell you, it is not Ludo. It's a game about strategy, right. definitely not Ludo. Um, and people would play that game, but also watch the game as well, because it's quite exciting. If I Google Uckers, I'll find it, will I? Yes, you will. Yeah, yeah. There's an app as well now, by all accounts. So. <laughs> great stuff. Um, question from Samuel. How many countries have you visited whilst being in the submarine service? Um, Hi, Samuel. That's a that's a really good question. I'd say um, probably about 25, 30 countries. Yeah. Okay. So there's, there's wider range. So um, you know, Dubai, Bahrain, um, down to the Seychelles, uh, Goa in India. That was pretty fantastic. Um, over to America. So San Diego, um, Connecticut, um, Tromso in Norway, the furthest north I've ever been. So yeah, yeah. loads of. Yeah, great stuff. We're, we're going to do one of the future episodes is somebody who's going to be talking about the importance of laughter in helping to alleviate um, anxiety and stress. Um, yes. And um, so Odette has a question for us because she's going to be delivering our series in the future, which is uh, how do you deal with stress on board? Good question. Yeah, uh, so so, so um, it, it can be quite stressful, The particularly during operational pieces, that, that can be very stressful. Um, so you deal with that piece by sticking to your routine and sticking to your procedures. And, and my job as, as the leader is to just calm people down and make sure that they do that stuff and try and take the emotion out of it. Um, the, the other piece about stress is uh, to deconflict early on. So you can imagine 129 guys in a very cramped place, it's, it's, it's an issue. Um, and you're going to get friction. And um, so sometimes have the discussion, what is niggling you? Get that out there. Yeah. Compromise as well the other way. Um, and sometimes you're going to have arguments. But as long as, as long as at the end of it, you, you're you friends again, then, yeah. then let the argument happen. It's venting. Yeah. We're going to show a picture in a minute, just in a minute. I've got a couple more questions, and then we'll show a picture of 
um, the submarine bursting through the, the ice cap. Come on to that in a second, something to look forward to. So next question from Jem. How do you deal with um, other people's um, mental fragility? Um, you know, what positive <clears throat> strategies uh, can people employ or what did you use? Yeah, so um, so for me personally, uh, it's, it's a really difficult position. They talk about a thing called the loneliness of command, which means all those things and the pressures that come from uh, taking 129 people away from their families to go off and do high-end, very dangerous missions and bring them back again is quite a lot of pressure. Uh, and generally, you can't share that with anybody. So, so for me, it was about reading books. Um, and I, I, I read a lot of autobiographies and from other leaders to understand how they thought about it. And playing the guitar was uh, was another way of decompressing, um, which for me it was. I don't think it was for the crew, but definitely for me. Um, but but for the crew, it was all about talking. So um, if if you've got a problem and you're worried about something, you talk it through with somebody. Uh, nobody would um, judge you for that, um, yeah. and and you you do it that way. And probably the the last bit for is humour. Um, submarine humour is. Uh, can be dark, um, but it's a strange. It's a strange world. Should we, should should we go there now? <laughs> no, no, I don't think we should. But but the um, but humour became a real tonic to yeah. stress. Yeah, yeah. Question from um, Sana. Hi, Sana. Lovely to uh, lovely to for you to ping a question. In. Uh, great to connect. Question is, what's your favourite quote and why? Hmm, interesting question. Favourite quote and why? You may not have an answer to it just now, but yeah, it's something. Let me think about that. I got a couple. So, so um, question from Jeremy: um, How do you cope without the internet? You know, oh. do you get news from the real world down under? Yeah. So, so you get what you get is a um, there's a very low frequency broadcast that um, actually goes through the waves. So radio frequencies that go through the, through the waves, and we can pick up that. The um, headquarters sends you. Uh, news once a day usually about one or two pages and it's a summary of uh, what's happening um, and it depends it depends who's uh, who's on watch in the headquarters at the time because it, it might be somebody who likes the telegraph and they'll pull out that stuff but it might be somebody who likes a local newspaper so you yeah. suddenly get stuff about some some city that nobody on board the submarine lives yeah. in so um so that's how you get it. Coping yeah. without the internet, it is fantastic. It is like um, just, it's great. Um, I, I think what what you what you end up with is just enough news to keep you yeah. thinking, uh, and not too much. And um, and basically, you have to resort back to the skills we needed in the last century, which is talking to each other and playing board games and telling stories yeah. and, and all that stuff. And um, yeah, it's, it's like a sabbatical, really. So, so important. It's such a great point you've just made about, you know, communication and talking to each other. And I think actually, maybe we should, um, maybe we should advocate, you know, unplugging the internet, you know, one day in the week, or, you know, in our family, we have something called digital detox, where we try not to, you know, look at our tech at all. So um, I think that's uh, something that, that we can all be thinking about. So I, mean, I myself have stopped to stop consuming so much news, um, yes. and uh, it's just there's so much going on. Question from Steve coming from Northamptonshire. Hi, Steve. Um, I've heard that submarine crews are quite wild after a long stint at sea. Is this true? And do you think the population may go a bit wild after lockdown? uh you you are right submarine crews are a bit wild when they uh when they get back um there, there, there's a reason for that and it's called decompression um so so it's it's letting off steam that the, the nobody nobody drinks nobody drinks at sea um alcohol does strange things doesn't it so they are wild um and i, I think you're right i think there will be a bit of that um when when we uh, come out of this I think the reality is it'll be slightly different. And the reason being is it's not going to be people going wild. It's going to be people who want to go save a food at a restaurant or do that kind of thing. Um, I don't think it's going to be people clubbing and yeah. doing yeah. that. I think it'll yeah. be more savoring the things that we have not had. So we've got um, a question from, uh, sorry, we got a question from, uh, so there's so many questions. I really want to try and get through them all. Um, question sure. from David uh, in, um, in Oxfordshire, I think. Um, hi, David. Uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, Question for Ryan, how do you exercise and stay fit on a submarine? Now, I know you're a bit of a health freak, so it'd be interesting to get your insights. Yeah, so, so um, you, you can do one of two things on board a submarine. You can not exercise, 
or and you can eat as much as you want um it's a sedentary life if you want it to be uh, or you can exercise my submarine were my crew were really heavily into their exercise so we had two rowing machines uh, one was <clears throat> one was near the engine room so that was quite quite warm uh, the other one was in a uh, sonar cabinet space which is quite cold um, and you have to because there's two cabinets either side of you pretty much like that you'd have to row with your your elbows in um, the other bit is that there was a stationary bike on the forward escape compartment but you'd have to you'd have to cycle with your head over one side in order to do that and then lastly there was um body weight exercise so lots of press-ups lots of sit-ups i had two dumbbells in my cabin at 17.5 kilogram dumbbells and i used to use those to do training um but i would train once twice a day and, and just keep going with that and watch what i had excellent i got a question from jason hi jason <laughs> does anyone uh, freak out with claustrophobia when on board in fact he's got a two-part question how do you how do you deal with claustrophobia on board great question yeah so um in in general before you join the submarine service um it, it's likely that they they find out whether you've got that you know you do medicals everything else psychological assessments um in, in my entire time i can only remember one um occasion that something like that's happened in that particular case it was hms turbulent in that in 2011 they sent out this young trainee um the giveaway was that he was six foot seven so he wasn't really going to fit in any in any way because the, the beds are six foot um yeah. so how he had ended up that's anyway so um we dived the sub he came on board the submarine <clears throat> dived the submarine and you could see that he didn't look particularly good at that point but we thought he'd settle down and after a couple of weeks yeah. um he didn't and uh, unfortunately he was sedated for until we could get him off and um and as soon as we could uh, we we headed back to port, got him off, and got him the help he needed. Uh, he's still in the navy now, but he's on the surface fleet. I know there are a lot of people who are talking yeah. at the moment about um, mental well-being and you know checking in and making sure that our own mental health is 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 okay, intact, balanced. Um, do you have any specific um, tips or observations mm -hmm. about mental health on board that can translate to, mm -hmm. for example? You know those in this country who are perhaps vulnerable yeah so, so i think where possible is to have a focus outside of what um what is going on um it's like i said I, I used to read books and i read books for two reasons one i'd find solace in in reading those and the other bit was to take me away from where i was and um i i, I find that that is a, a really important thing uh, to, to to keep you focused um but it's almost thinking about the future as well what what are we going to prepare to do uh, and how am i going to prepare myself for that and if you've got those two that uh, they focus you away from the daily activity that we're having yeah. to do on a daily basis so another kind of which is um it's fantastic thank you very much keep the questions coming we're going to try and try and get through as many as we can um how hard is it to adjust when you're when you're back on shore yeah so so that is quite difficult uh, and we're going to go through a period of that um, when we pull out of this so uh, they, they talk about a thing called decompression which is you've gone you've, you've done high-end operations with your team it's everything has been about you and your team and nobody else you know you, you've forgotten about your families and as awful that, as that sounds uh, that's what it is and to readjust to normal life is really quite quite a challenge you can't talk about anything that you've done on board the submarine except with the people on the submarine and therefore you almost have more in common with them than you do with your own family and therefore to try and adjust uh to the normality of life um is a really tough tough job but it takes a couple of weeks and then you're, you're back into it so um and normality i i remember the fact that going to a shop and uh, being asked to choose which chicken for the roast dinner and yeah. of course at that point i'm still in my military mode going Hey, you make this decision all the time. You decide which chicken it is. And being told, being told, uh, being yes. told, I can make that decision. I'm just involving you in the decision making process. I went, ah, right, okay, got it. Very good. Yeah, very good. Um, conflict. Uh, again, we we touched on this, and uh, again, you know, there are lots of um, little little uh, moments of stress going on in in households and families across the country. In fact, it's something that we're going to be picking up on in, in our next episode in a couple of weeks' time. Um, one or two perspectives in terms of managing or de-escalating or taking the heat out of uh, situations on board. 
Yeah, have have a discussion early. So if if something's niggling, um, yeah, have that discussion early, and then and then compromise as well. So there's a piece about turning around and saying, "Hey, look, I'm asking you to do this because it really annoys me or it really irritates me." But in return, what do you need me to do, and what is what can I do to make it better? Um, and I think if you have that communication uh, and that compromise, um, you, you deconflict well. Yeah, we're going to put up a picture. Hopefully, uh, Grace got a picture lined up for us of the sub bursting through the ice. Um, just want uh, to get a little insight in terms of what that was like and, and the whole um, the whole sort of strategy of bringing a submarine up through the ice. Um, just just chat through a little bit of what, what we're seeing here. Yeah. So the first the first one is to um, the, the ice underneath is is not flat, you know, about icebergs and everything else. So you can have ice kills that are 250 meters deep. And so you've got to find the right place to break through the ice. <clears throat> so we have sonars and the ability to measure ice thickness. And then what, what you do is you find either a polynia, which is uh, basically C, or in this case, uh, that was about a meter and a bit thick ice. And then the fin, the sail that you can see there, um, you place that under the ice. So you, you basically sat there and the submarines just sat there like that. And it's positively buoyant, it's pushing, but it's never gonna get break through. And then you use the high pressure air system to force the submarine through, and then the fin appears like that through the ice, and that's yeah. it. That's quite a quite a you know quite a high risk procedure. Yes, it is. Yeah, but but most submarine operations are. I mean, it's a, it's a risky piece of equipment, and it's a, a crew that is immensely trained in order to do that. So, so what you wouldn't do is go uh, under the ice without the training that that you need to do before that. And you take, yeah. you take this you take this amazing person with you called an ice pilot and this guy is the expert for the polar region yeah. and the ice pilot will turn around and say yeah that you want to look around this area here and and, and that's where you surface so you leave off their expertise we've got another picture which grace is just going to pop up now i wonder whether or not because when i was at the north pole uh, some some years ago you could have been lurking beneath the ice couldn't you really quite frankly yeah we could have uh, I don't. I don't think we were, but yeah, absolutely. Yeah, there was, no, there was no, no evidence of any submarines where I, where I was at ninety degrees north. But uh, anyway, Grace, we can move on now. So um, another question, actually, from uh, Jason: Do you do you ever hear any sounds from outside the submarine? You, you do, yes. Um, <clears throat> so so you can hear. Um, you, you can hear uh, biologics, so you can hear uh, on, the, on the sonar definitely, and, uh, you can definitely hear things like snapping shrimp and a variety of things. Through the hull itself, um, you could you could hear whales, um, and you can hear, um, well, you can hear sonar like you were, you were transmitting, so if a ship or yeah. a submarine is transmitting its sonar, you'll hear that through the hull as well. Yeah. We've got about 15 minutes more left of this series. Fascinating insights. I'm sure that everyone agrees. There are lots and lots of questions coming in. So these are going to be some quick fire questions, as sure. uh, quick as we can, Ryan, with them. From Jane. Thank you, Jane, for your question. What do you do to build teams? So again, team working um, and team skills on board. How do you do that? Yeah, so so first one is uh, have the right vision, what you're trying to do, sense of purpose, um, focus on the mission. Yeah. Everybody focus. What are you doing to contribute to the mission? I don't mind whether you're making food or you're um, a marine engineer or whether you're a warfighter. The reality is everybody you need everybody in order to do that. And as soon as you realize that it involves the whole team and not just individuals, yeah. you build the team. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Question from Nicola. Can you have any permanent problems health wise from working in the environment for long periods of time? Uh, I, think they, I think they've done loads of studies into that and there's no permanent health issues that come from working in board submarines. Question from David, do you have women on submarines these days? They, they do, yes. Uh, they're on board the Trident, uh, the, the bigger submarines, uh, Trident missiles. And there's there's a variety of navies that have females um, in, in the submarine service. And they add, you know, that they're, they're, they're just fantastic people. Submariner first, it doesn't matter what race you are, it doesn't matter what gender you are, you're a Submariner first. Yeah. Question from Steve, what's the deepest that you've ever been? I, I can't tell you that, but it's um, that? deeper than 300 meters. So question from Sana. Hi, Sana. Lovely, lovely to get your question. You said that you like to read autobiographies about other great leaders. Um, so, Ryan, what is one of the best books that you've read? Um, and by the way, this individual says, I think you're amazing and a great leader. 
Oh, you're very kind. <laughs> Thank you. You're very kind. Um, I, I'd, I'd plug my own book by about now, wouldn't I? So um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not going to do Go that. For it. Go for it. Go for it. I wrote a book about um, what it was like to be a submarine captain called SSN 14, and all the profit from that goes to service charities to help veterans. I don't take any money. From it. Um, but that's not the best book to read, to be quite frank. So it's 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 good, but it's not yeah. the best uh, for yeah. me. Um, I like reading any books about Nelson, to be quite frank. He's a hero of mine. And um, yeah, learning about how he led in, in in every day is interesting. And there's a little question here popped up um, which, around sleep. So sleep is clearly, you know, very, very important on board a submarine. Good quality sleep. You know, what can you do to help people perhaps who are struggling with sleep at the moment or perhaps who have insomnia? Um, you know how how you know how does that work on board? So, and is, so, there a, is, there a, is there a correlation with performance and lack of sleep? Yes, there there, there absolutely is. So um, the fact is, you, sleep is a weapon for for the submarine service. They say it's a weapon because the guy who's rested or the team that's rested is the team that wins. Yeah. Um, so so making sure that people um, people get their sleep, make sure that people turn around and, and arrested is really, really important. I, I can't think that I've ever experienced anybody having insomnia because you're quite exhausted. Yes. Um, so the reality is yeah. you, you can get tired, you need to sleep and you move on. I think, you know, just in terms of sleep and those um, people with um, muscular dystrophy such as myself, and I know that we've got many of our beneficiaries and families that have tuned in. It's an interesting thing that you just said about sleep being a weapon to help you uh, be the best you can be. Um, yes. I think from you know from my perspective, I, I recognize that having six, seven hours of, if that's possible, good sleep, good quality sleep, I do feel better and I can perform better across the day. Um, so you know, I think sleep right now is important for all of us in, in different ways, is it not? So really? um, somebody's asked, do you have a favorite quote? Yeah, so I think the best one that you can have is, life is what happens when you're making plans. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah, that's, True. That's, a, that's a very good thing. And I've got a question for you, actually, Ryan. One of my heroes is the great um, Irish polar explorer, Sir Ernest Shackleton. OK, oh, yeah. and his family motto, Fortitude Vincimus, for the, for the Latin scholars um, amongst us here today, literally translated means by endurance we conquer. And I think that's really relevant at this moment in time. You know, do you have a hero? I use that word thoughtfully. And does he or she perhaps have a motto that you that you can share with us at some point um, that might be helpful uh, during these these challenging times. So, so I'll share a motto first, and then um, so the first one is turbulenta hostibus fiat, which is Agemus Turbulence motto, and that was troublesome to our enemies. And I used to like that term, and I used to use it all the time because it didn't matter whether you're friends or enemies, we were always troublesome to the enemies and we would do everything to support everybody else. And it was the real focus uh, focus for us. Um, with regards to heroes, I, I don't have one hero because I think um, if, if I turn around and said it's a military, you, you know, there are so many amazing people in the world today. And, and I draw real energy from seeing um, amazing people do amazing things. And it doesn't matter. Um, it, it, you, you couldn't give it to one person. I, I, I just don't think I, I pull the best that I can from everybody and hopefully alter my my own life accordingly from, from the great work that everybody does. Good question. Thank you for that. Yeah. Good question <laughs> on polar bears. Um, oh. Have you encountered a polar bear in your, in your polar world? Bears. Yes. Yeah, so, so, so they they give you some polar bear training when you go up to the um, uh, on the submarine and they turn around and say uh, that they have a thing called an ice camp. And they say, if you want to go to the toilet, you go to this particular area. But before you leave the ice camp, make sure you shine a torch and yeah. outside. And if you see any eyes come back, don't go out. Yeah. And that's, that's great. Um, so, and then the other bit is on the submarine, they'll have a guy with a, a rifle uh, who's there as polar bear watch while everybody else is milling around or playing cricket because we have an obsession with playing cricket up at the North Pole. Um, and uh, and he's supposed to be there to, to warn off the... Uh, worn off the uh, polar bear and i tell you what i don't i don't think the polar bear would be scared by that remotely so um so so actually it's just about watching and making sure you move before they get to you really so how did how did how did cricket on the arctic ice cap uh, how did that unfold 
Uh, well, basically, so so um, stumps into the ice. Yeah, that, no, they did it. They managed to get stumps into the ice. So take a drill up there, just drill enough to get the stumps in, and then. <laughs> very good. Very good. Um, question from Nicola. Thanks, Nicola. What's the most amazing thing or sight that you've ever seen um, from the top of the sun? Two killer whales at speed. Wow. We were at speed going through the Gibraltar Straits. And I looked down and by the side of us for two killer whales at speed, the same speed that we were going. I used to love dolphins playing at the bow of the submarine because it pushes through the water and they love riding the wave. Um, but to see two killer whales was just incredible. Thank you. So um, I any more questions coming through? I, we've got through a lot of questions. Uh, Ryan, you've been fantastic. Thank you. Thank you so much. There may be one or two more questions uh, coming th through, but um, we're gonna we're just gonna put a ticker message on, on the screen um, for for you as we go into the the close. But from really on behalf of the charity, and just checking to make sure there are no more questions at the moment. No, but if there are. Um, we'll fire them through to you. But heartfelt thanks, Ryan, um, for being our first guest. You know what? If I can invite you to uh, to give us your your best muscle warrior salute, please, Ryan. Oh, fantastic. So for those that don't know, a muscle warrior salute is a visible symbol of hope, courage, uh, strength, and unity for all those with muscular dystrophy uh, across this country. Thank you, Ryan. And if people wish to contact, uh, make contact with you, or shoot over any questions, Ryan, how can they reach you? So you, you can either find me on uh, LinkedIn um, and you can find me on Twitter as well. So um, my Good. my hashtag is at Ryan Ramsey 14. Hashtag. Oh, it's not a hashtag, is it? What is it? Twitter handle. Twitter handle. That's yeah, that's that. Cool. I guess, well, we'll make sure that that's that's uh, that's out there. And of course, you know what? We'd love everyone's feedback, our viewers today. So please head over to the charity's Facebook page where you'll find a, a survey monkey link. It'd be really grateful if you could just spend a minute or two. Let's have your feedback, any comments, so we can really, you know what, improve the experience going forwards. And if you'd like to make a donation, do you know families are more isolated than ever? And so any donations to, to help us expand our virtual efforts will be hugely, hugely appreciated. Thank you. For those that wish to, to get involved or if you're able to uh, connect us uh, with others to help support our community, head over to musclehop.com and drop us a message. And of course, for our beneficiaries and families, to all of you that have uh, tuned in today, thank you, thank you, thank you. And you know what? We'll always be stronger together. And please do reach out with your ideas and um, any suggestions with how the charity can continue to support you virtually uh, at this testing time. And finally, don't forget to uh, tune in for episode two on Friday, the 29th of May. That's Friday, the 29th of May. And I'll be hosting an interactive session all about family communication skills in times of adversity with lots of opportunity to get involved, share ideas, and of course, ask questions. We'll be hearing from Sue Durakin, a high-flying trainer. Um, who's worked with many, many top companies and who since lockdown at home with her husband and not one, not two, but three teenagers. Yes, three teenagers. She's been reflecting on how we can build our resilience um, as families and households uh, to cope with stressful situations. So I know that Sue is going to be sharing three amazing skills that will enable families to support each other in ways, do you know what, that we can only ever dream of. For now, stay safe, stay well, and have a great weekend. Thank you. <laughs>